R-U-B-Y-M-O, and we're going to be talking about Ruby on Rails performance Q&A. Alexander is an entrepreneur, Y Combinator alum, project manager, free software developer, book author, passionate about programming, engineering, hardcore Linux oil, as we've uh, <laughs> seen in the setup period. Uh, regular, uh, regularly attended and presented at KDE, Ruby, and Postgres conferences. Most recently enjoyed the startup scene working at Elysio Energy, <laughs> and the retail electric electricity supplier and Acumen. I think we'll let him take it from there, but uh, yeah, so we're really excited to have Alexander here today, and we're going to start with a short conversation, and uh, then go into some Q&A. So Alexander, why don't you maybe tell us a little bit more about yourself, and then we can start with a quick presentation. All right, thank you for having me, and uh, thank you everyone for attending. Um, so yeah, that's like basically uh, for the last seven years I've been doing Ruby and Rails programming and had a lot of performance problems so that's what I was interested in in solving them and uh, get some pretty solid knowledge and pretty solid understanding of some of the problems with Ru Ruby and Rails performance so uh, I would be excited to help you guys with uh, uh, that and answer as many questions uh, as I can. Um, so I think we could start with some informal introduction uh, into Rails performance world. Um, so let me show the The slides. So um, what I'm was what I'm going to talk about is performance optimization and more exactly the code optimization. Um, basically, I'm not going to talk about scaling or caching. It's uh, just because those areas are very well known. Um, and what I'm interested in is code optimization, which is less known in Rails world and less known even in Ruby world. Uh, and in my experience, what you really want to optimize in Ruby, any Ruby and Rails program is First of all, memory. Uh, there's not many, there are not many things that can optimize uh, that much. And memory is where the most time is usually spent. So it's, it's a common knowledge that a Ruby garbage collector is bad and it's slow, and that's why you always want to kind of uh, give it less work to do. And that's, that's what I'm teaching usually people, is to optimize memory first and see if that helped. If that didn't help, then you have to do something else. But in 99% of the cases, uh, memory is what you want to optimize. I mean, memory usage, I mean, uh, less object creation, stuff like that. And once that is done, the next step would be to optimize slow code. Uh, I mean, algorithmically slow code, uh, meaning that you need to look at what is executed inside loops and optimize that. And if that doesn't help, the only course to go is to write less Ruby. This means uh, you need to write in C, you need to uh, do more SQL queries, and basically that's it. Um, during all those, uh, you need to control your memory. You need to set up something that controls the size of your program and kills it if it grows too big. Because if it's uh, if it takes one gig of RAM, you're not good to go. Uh, on Heroku, you will need to pay more. Uh, and 
or have your application killed by their memory control. So this is a big picture of what Rails performance optimization and Ruby performance optimization is, in my opinion, and um, I think at this point, kind of interesting. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. So uh, just uh, just uh, let me do a brief introduction. So, uh, just f uh, feel free to interrupt me at any time. So I want it to be interactive and uh, not one-way talk. So yeah, go ahead, Obi. Sure. I, um, so I, I wanted you to mention maybe some of the uh, some of the projects where you've gotten experience. Also, yeah. So you know, we all need to go. We can just jump right into this. I know. As part of your diagnosis, and you guys. Some of my projects, right? Uh, did I hear it correctly? Yeah, yeah. Um, so most most of this was uh, like discovered when I was working on Akino, the project online project management system. Uh, and one of the challenges was to uh, render a lot of objects on the screen in meaningful meaningful time. Uh, you can imagine if you have a project management system which is used in a large organization, what you will get is pro probably at least 1,000 tasks per, per person, and that list can usually grow a lot during the year. And most of our customers stayed with us for three to five years, so their project, uh, so their tasks, task lists are too big, are way too big to render. Uh, and what other project management systems did is they kind of reduced the scope of what they are rendering, uh, what they are presenting. That's of course the right way to go, but sometimes you really want the whole list, and to my knowledge, only Akinot could render the whole list in reasonable amount of time, being still a pure Rails application without any uh, code in C or Scala or whatever. So that, that was the main source of my experience. Here in my next company, Alga Energy, uh, we're still uh, having performance problems, but now we... Uh, those are different performance problems. We're processing, processing a lot of data, and a lot of data means million rows, millions of rows of data, and Ruby's just not good at that. But if you know how to do things right, you still can kind of uh, do that in Ruby without resorting to any external solution. So. Currently, my approach uh, is write Ruby as much as possible and write SQL uh, to analyze the data to get the like, to, to perform large computations, uh, something like this. Uh, any other questions? Um, when you're, uh, my name is Mike. When when you are working on uh, SQL queries in Ruby, are you finding that um, the SQL is hard to maintain? Uh, I often hear uh, that one of the drawbacks of SQL is that it's it's just, it sucks up a lot of developer time and it's kind of hard to read and a little bit more brittle than sort of your standard active record stuff. Uh, I think it depends on the team and honestly, on the team management. So in my practi practice, I hadn't got any maintenance problems with SQL, and usually what I saw is that well-written SQL code is easier to maintain than a huge amount of Ruby code that does this, exactly the same thing. Well, I. I had the screenshot at some point uh, with the huge SQL query, which replaced uh, about 3K of Ruby code. So as you may imagine that having like 200 lines of SQL code is better than 
having 3,000 lines of Ruby code. <laughs> are, there, are those 200 lines all in a stored procedure? Hmm? Sorry? Are, are those 200 lines all in one stored procedure? Because in that case, it might be worse. Well, they... Um, like the way the, these uh, 300 lines were built is that there is some Ruby script that builds it. Because uh, uh, sometimes you need to have some dynamic code in there. But uh, in our new company, Allegro Energy, we are not doing this. We are doing as much plain SQL as possible, and it still works pretty well. So at the end, it all boils down to teaching developers to write proper SQL. Because uh, usually what I see is that uh, Ruby developers tend to not write SQL in canonical way. Like they know it uh, usually, but they do not do it in canonical ways. So you need to teach them how to do it. You need to teach uh, to how to write maintainable SQL code. It's possible. Just uh, need to learn this. Um, And, of course, with SQL, you get just tremendous performance improvement. Um, well, let me actually show you the example. I have some small example. Cool. So what I'm about to show is, yeah, it's this. Uh, can you see it well? Or yes, lo looks uh, looks good. Okay, so uh, this is the um, synthetic example, but the one that I really like because it illustrates the performance of SQL queries really good. So suppose you have a simple table uh, with departments, employees, and their salaries, and you want to do a group rank. So you want to rank employees within the department by salary. And with Postgres, you can do that in one query, uh, which uses uh, Postgres specific, in, in this case, uh, uh, window functions. And the idea behind this query is that it just takes rows one by one, partitions them by department, and then orders by salary, and then we just need to assign the rank. Um, so this, this is basically two lines of SQL code. Uh, try to do the same thing in Ruby in two lines. In two lines, it's not possible. Uh, like the smallest implementation I came with, like 10 lines of code, and it's uh, 10 times slower. Um, below, I had this comparison table, which shows that, indeed, Ruby is 10 times slower doing exactly this task. Uh, and this is uh, with Ruby 2.0 and higher. If you have older Ruby, it's not good. Once you have uh, a lot of rows, your garbage collector does not, uh, just sometimes does not finish. Uh, what I mean is that the performance of Ruby garbage collector these days with 2.0, 2.1, is linear. But before that, it wasn't linear. So if you got 10k rows, it was quite fast. 100,000 uh, rows, that's okay. 1 million rows, 1.9 will take a lot of time, and 1.8 will never finish. So this is my experience with SQL and Ruby. Cool. I uh, So I'm a, I'm a beginning Ruby dev. I like you know can do some basic stuff. Um, I guess for me, I don't. I guess I've never really gotten something to the size where, or I think I haven't gotten something to the size where I've had performance issues. But 
like, I guess I'm just wondering, how do you first tell if you have a performance issue? Like, uh, when I do, like, uh, when I, like, load my um, my site, I, I, know, I know there's some websites I can go to, like, to see, uh, you know, how long the site, like, a page loads and why it takes so long, things like that. I forget what, what one's called, but I, I know I've used them before. But, like, do you use something like that? Or, like, yeah, how do you determine that there is a performance issue? Um, I come to this, I answer this question from a completely different side, from the business standpoint. So if I pay too much, that's the problem. Right? That's when I have a problem. Uh, for example, uh, if, if I have to pay Heroku uh, three grand per month, I have a performance problem definitely. Because I, you usually can solve performance problems by scaling, and that that's what people do, and that's what I do as well, uh, by default. But once I hit certain limit on spending, it's it means that I have to optimize. Another, well, another thing is uh, uh, you you can you can have some monitor tools like New Relic. New Relic is usually pretty decent. Uh, which will tell you the average response time, the AppDex score, some performance score that they compute. And if that's bad, and if so that looks you, bad, you then that. you have a problem. Okay. So and, and, and is that like a yes-no thing, or is it like you have to have some sort of judgment on what is bad, or do they, do they kind of tell you what, what bad is? Um, they kind of try to tell, but you can always uh, set up your own limits uh, and alerts. So I usually I usually try to judge myself, um, but by any uh, but in any case, if your application response in more than a second, you have a definitely performance problem. <laughs> so. Okay. Um, cool, but uh, okay, great. Uh, I can keep asking questions. Or does Michael, do you have a question over there? I do. Um, so one of the things that's not quite clear to me yet is um, when you were talking about optimizing memory, were you talking essentially just about limiting the number of objects uh, that you created, or is there is there something else more specific that you had in mind? Uh, because I understand, like, for optimizing loops and, like, you want... Uh, you know, to have the best, you know, when you do your big O notation, you want it to, you know, be faster, uh, not slower. But I, I didn't quite understand the optimized memory beyond don't instantiate more objects than you need. Well, the memory optimization is basically two things. Uh, allocate less memory and allocate less objects. So Ruby Garbage Collector uh, has two triggers. One is uh, based on the number of objects, and another one is based on the uh, memory allocation. And what you want to uh, do is to minimize the number of times garbage collector gets triggered, and then minimize the total memory usage, uh, so that garbage collector, when it's triggered, has less work to do. So what I've been doing is I've been doing uh, several strategies. So let me um, let me show you some some of them. Okay, so let's start with something obvious and then move to. So yeah, this this should be obvious. Uh, if you want to do modification on strings, arrays, hashes, ranges, just do it in line. Um, if you want to read the file or CSV, uh, just do it line by line so that previous line can be garbage, collect garbage collected before uh, or during this loop. So for example, if you read the whole file in memory, it will stay in memory. And it will be garbage collected after you've finished with this. Uh, when you do that line by line, there is a chance that garbage collector kicks in and uh, collects all previously read lines that you do not need. 
and with CSV it's even more important uh, because what I saw is that CSV parser has a huge overhead. So for example, if you have 10 megabytes of CSV file, it usually translates into 113 megabytes, something like that. So it's usually 13 times more than the size of the data. Um, CSV class is really bad in this. Uh, if we speak with, uh, about Rails, what I found uh, useful is limit the, the number of columns you select. It's so important uh, because Rails usually adds three, three x overhead. So if you have uh, 10 megabytes of data in database, uh, Postgres will take about 11 megabytes on disk and Rails will take about 30 megabytes in memory just to retrieve those uh, that data. Uh, so what you want to do is to retrieve less columns so that Rails does not have uh, to store them in, in memory. Uh, I found that select is, is really good. Uh, it's not that you, so you cannot select easily columns if you have uh, nested, uh, if you have uh, associations. So if you have a post model and associated comments, you need to do a join and that has its own problems, but it's possible to do. Another one that people don't really use that often and they usually should is that instead of doing find on a model, you need to run find in batches. And that will fetch a batch of objects, uh, then you can work with them, and then garbage collector can get rid of that. Uh, and then you can uh, move on to the next batch of objects. So, all these three hands may reduce your memory consumption significantly. In I did some basic measurements, uh, and in my cases, uh, I sometimes had 150 max of data, and if I used select and find in batches, uh, I get this down to just 15 max of data. And sometimes uh, you don't really want to do any active record at all. You can just uh, execute a SQL query. Uh, you can just uh, do select values to have an array of hashes that represent your data, but without instantiated any active record. Uh, or you can do the same in Arrow with block or you can do updates without active record. So the update all uh, syntax does not instantiate any active record objects at all. And so yeah, the active record overhead is usually uh, 3x size of data and uh, in most cases it allocates about two objects per data value. Cool. Uh, I have a question from Benjamin. Uh, he's asked, so active record base is designed to handle partial data and subclasses of active record base should be able to handle partial, partial data as well? Is, is, that, is, that, is that true? Yeah, that's true. So mm -hmm. unless, uh, so and, until you, uh, you select all data you want uh, and you ask for, it will work. It, uh, it, it is actually work, works beautifully. Do you know if there's a method to see if um, data is just missing, if um, a field has just not been loaded due to the select thing? Uh, I don't know if there is a Rails function to query that on top of my head, but uh, you could al always ask for uh, like objects, object respond to. If it doesn't respond to something, then uh, you haven't got it. 
but uh, speaking about respond to, respond to is not is what I call not iterate or safe operation. So make sure re you do not call respond to within a loop. Mm -hmm. Have you had any trouble with um, with um, select? Like, have you ran into um, to classes on projects you've worked on that haven't been designed to handle partial data and um, how do you sort of design your code um, to provide the uh, full um, capabilities of active record? Um, I, I actually didn't have this problem at all mm -hmm. with the partial data. Mm -hmm. uh, just most of the code does not care about most of the attributes. Um, mm -hmm. And if you write, like, if you, if you follow good practices, like having small functions that, have, uh, that do specific tasks, then well, you don't have this problem. You just select, you work, and then you uh, get rid of the uh, objects, and that's it. Uh, so no, 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 no real problems with this. That sounds good. And no problems with external tools as well, as far as I know. Maybe maybe somebody uh, had this problem, but I, I didn't. Mm -hmm. And Rails always uses the uh, table names in its um, joins, and so you just uh, use the uh, table names when you want to get a specific um, table's attribute. Um, yeah, probably referring to that example. Yes. Uh, yeah, because when I was writing custom SQL um, in another framework, I was always um, renaming it to something shorter, and I'm glad Rails doesn't try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I rarely re uh, rename uh, attributes at all, even uh, when I write play in SQL. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, yeah, you, you have to do what what Rails think is is useful, uh, and they 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 used some different way of uh, aliasing tables in Rails too, but they do not anymore. Thankfully, so it's predictable. You just use yeah. a table name. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, speaking about that example, in Postgres, you you have a better way of uh, doing this join. But I don't know if you're interested in this. But yeah, I'm interested. Um, okay, let me try to. Um, Show you how to do this in Postgres. I don't know what's the, the best way to do this. I can probably just share the, the window. Okay. So the problem with that join is that it it will return too many rows, and what you really want to do is to have one row per uh, one row, and a kind of a group or array from uh, the associated table. So here is uh, how I tried to do this. So in Postgres, you have the uh, what they call array aggregator. So when you join another table, you can join it and aggregate the that column into an array. And Rails is actually good at uh, working with this array. So this is the query that uh, I do. So I select uh, parent ta table columns, aggregate child table columns, do any join, and then just group by par parent attributes. So that I have one row per, uh, for, uh, one row uh, for parent table. Um, did I explain it correctly, or uh, my English wasn't good enough in this case? 
No, it's good. Okay. Thanks. All right. Any other questions? Okay. If so, if we have no questions, let me show you something that I recently discovered that is it might be useful for you as well. Awesome. Sounds great. Uh, one of the discoveries was about Rails template rendering. I always knew that rendering too many partials is a big problem with Rails, uh, but just didn't know how big. And uh, a couple of days ago, I actually went ahead and measured this. So imagine you have a lot, a large list of objects to render, and the usual, usual approach is just to render partial per each object. And that's good, except that it performs really bad. So in my case, I rendered 10,000 objects, and those partials were just empty. So imagine rendering 10,000 of empty partials. What do you get? You get almost two seconds of slowdown. So Rails 4 takes two seconds just to render 10,000 partials. Uh, of course, that number scales. So um, if you have uh, 100,000 partials, you'll get uh, your 20 seconds of rendering time. Alex, uh, you, don't, you don't have to answer this right now. You can answer it later if you want. But, I mean, it, it occurs to me that there's never a situation where you want to render 10,000 partials. It's just too much to be rendering on page. Um, I would agree with it, with this uh, in most cases, um, except that sometimes you do need to render this. Uh, maybe it has something to do with the type of applications that I'm writing and uh, kind of design decision. Yeah, I mean. I, I'm, I'm not, I think it's a little, it's probably a little out of scope, but I mean, it's worth mentioning that the, some of the worst performance problems that I've seen, uh, you know, doing Rails for almost 10 years have been where things like this have happened, where, uh, you know, there wasn't pagination put in, or it just wasn't, it, it just wasn't a good application design, right, like, so you're, if you, Abuse the technology stack that you're working with. For instance, like uh, there was one project I remember the specifics of it very well because it was a pretty long time. But there was a you, they were basically rendering a spreadsheet on the server side, and it had a lot of partials, like you know, partials within partials within partials to generate all the cells, and it was very very slow, but. You know, it's probably not a matter of optimizing it at that point. It's a matter of just reconsidering, hey, I'm going to probably do it the right way. Uh, because I think the solutions that were proposed for that were, uh, well, you know, maybe we should cat, you know, maybe we should implement cell level caching and stuff like that. And it's like, well, wait a minute, you know, we're, we're probably using the wrong <laughs> And now it's left. Did that was good. He got the boot. <laughs> <laughs> He's officially been loaded out of the top. He dropped the mic. He's like, oh. Marky. <laughs> oh, man. See, that's what happens when you have a certain talk on Aircom. You just get, you get out. You're right out of there. Yeah, you're doing it wrong. Maybe one of you knows. I, I wanted to ask a question. Um, have you have you done any benchmarking between the sort of like the uh, 
you know, Engine Yard and Heroku and, and maybe Ninefold um, and perhaps some lesser known passes. I was just curious just how much just like a, a vanilla choice between vendors matters in performance. I have it. Oh man, uh, Moby, that was our that was our largest shot. <laughs> well, I mean, it's been it's been since Hash Rocket Day since I used Engine Yard. And uh, I've just used Heroku ever since. And uh, I don't know. I'm sure. I'm sure that there. I mean, there, there's some of these things that are really eye-opening when you look at, uh, like how a few lines of Ruby can, you know, done one way or another can affect whether the, the garbage compiler gets kicked in or not. Um, and I'm I'm sure that you know when you if you actually jump in to do some optimizations on your app, you're gonna you're gonna see some hotspots around the utilization for that. You can you can dive in. You can do kind of this deep level optimization. But for uh, I'm a little skeptical about how often these things are actually useful uh, because I, I feel like if the app, if the app is written is architected correctly, then it probably shouldn't be like this. But I, I don't know. It, it, it's probably just circumstantial. Like it's, you know, the, the types of apps that I've worked on versus what other people are trying to do. I have word from our great educator, Alexander Demo, uh, that he will return. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I may have to cut out in about five minutes. So. Okay. Well, maybe maybe that. Okay. Whoa, he's back. Yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Uh, so we did our best to keep talking, but we're going to... So, where did you think? Okay, Michael, do you want to you ask your question again of Alex, oh. Alexander, just so maybe see, take, take his take on that? Yeah, I, I was wondering if you had uh, done any benchmarking or had any tips on uh, performance across various Rails platform as a service offerings like Engineer Art, Heroku, uh, Ninefold, and maybe maybe some other options I'm not thinking of. Um, so w what specifically are well, you interested um, in? Like, uh, is there uh, maybe maybe my uh, well, like you said, you spend a lot of money on Heroku dinos uh, <laughs> or, or or have, uh, and I thought maybe you had bumped into an issue where you discovered that Engine Yard is just faster or um, Heroku is never fast compared to anything else or uh, or just like I don't know uh, do you have any thoughts on past performance uh, on different platforms I guess is my question um, okay so uh, the last time I did the research like this was two or three years ago I mean the last time I got some hard data to compare uh, and at that point, uh, I had. Uh, do you remember this uh, Asus EPC computer? Is that one of those really slow netbooks? Right. So Engine Yard at that time was as fast as my EPC, uh, but that was like three or four years ago. Uh, I don't know how well they perform right now. Uh, Speaking about Heroku, I have, uh, in terms of pure performance, I haven't got any any real issues with that. Um, it's okay, and uh, for heavy applications, I just have to buy this uh, uh, 2x Dino, or how's it, how's it called? Uh, oh, the Dino XL or whatever. Yeah. And so if you have a performance problem on Heroku, in my experience, is, uh, is that it's, it's not Heroku's fault for that. Uh, I know some people ha have the performance problem with Heroku, but I did. Uh, it's, uh, it's usually on par with what you get in your desktop computer uh, well, with regard, uh, regarding the numbers. Uh, and in most cases, this is okay. 
I mean, it's not a dedicated hardware, but in most cases, it's it's really okay. And if I see, I usually I usually get uh, uh, response time for my applications below uh, half a second easily without doing any like, significant performance optimization. And in in most cases, it's uh, just a matter of. 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds response time. And uh, for my previous startup, uh, at Keynote, we had to invest in real hardware. So we, uh, we had dedicated servers, uh, and we ran our own setup on that. And the reason for that is that we we had to configure it so that we had more memory, more memory for Postgres and more memory for for Ruby applications. So basically, uh, in my opinion, if you have a really heavy task, you'd better buy your hardware and have uh, something like I don't know, 64 gigs of RAM on it. And that's it. Like that solves all performance problems right away. <laughs> good, uh, good, good takeaway from the talk. Sixty-four gigs solves all performance. <laughs> no, <laughs> go home. Uh, Stop. <laughs> yeah. Well, if if world was so so simple, then yes. Uh, but unfortunately, <laughs> it's not. Uh, sometimes. Um, Sometimes it's not so simple. I mean, uh, if if it's memory for Postgres, then yes, you will need to scale it and scale it and scale it infinitely. But if it's memory for Ruby process, you have a problem because if your Ruby problem allocates 64 gigs of memory, it's a problem, right? Uh, even if it's allocating in one gig of memory, it's a problem. I usually have some monitoring uh, inside, built in inside. Uh, my application uh, to check resident size of the uh, process and kill if it's uh, if it's too big, for example, like two or three hundred megabytes, because at that point, garbage collector takes about uh, hundred more than hundred milliseconds just to do a single run. So you need to make sure. It's not taking too long to garbage collect your your data. What about uh, like um, having um, an account, um, like the concept of a user account or something? And um, that would would it improve performance to have the uh, user account uh, field be present on? Um, Here's an example. A user has conversations. A conversation has messages. <laughs> um, would it solve performance problems to um, have um, the user ID appear both on um, conversations, so user.conversations, and then also appear on conversations.messages? Um, yes, it will. It will improve your uh, performance regarding to uh, database queries, which is Sometimes a lot, and sometimes which does not help. Uh, in uh, in Acunode, we had the concept of organization, which uh, signed up. Uh, so we had org ID in every single table, and we had a scope on that. Uh, oh, that has good. yeah. So I that has that two good. two benefits. First is that you have uh, you don't really need to write any code to support multi-user, multi multi-organization setup in Rails. You just uh, need to set up the scope correctly. And a second, you get some performance benefits out of that. And if you have indexes, database indexes on org ID or user ID in your case, it's, it's even better. Mm -hmm. The reason I thought of it was because when you mentioned memory, I was thinking that um, that in um, like a SaaS offering, the most records that any single organization might have might pop out at like 5,000, and that might be a case where a um, less powerful um, SQL thing um, couldn't handle it, but a more powerful one could because 5,000 isn't really big to a uh, large database server, I guess. 
uh, 5,000, it's it's nothing. Uh, so I had uh, I had analytics queries, SQL queries uh, to run on uh, millions of rows of data. Um, that is not too much for Postgres. Mm -hmm. Even if it's not uh, indexed beyond the organization, the standard organization index, it can churn through them, I guess. Yeah. But in my case, it was like cross organization query, so ah. could, couldn't really uh, do anything about this. Uh, but yeah, that, that's definitely a well, valid approach. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Uh, right. Any other questions? I think we have a new new member, Hank. If Hank, if you have any questions, feel free to shoot them out there. Otherwise, uh, yeah, does anybody else have any questions? Maybe uh, Johan or anybody? Anybody else? Hank, I think you might be muted. I was just saying hello for the evening and just seeing what was going on. So Sweet. I'm going to be the bystander. Hey, Hank. Hey, OB. <laughs> what Cheers. up? Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't realize it was beer o'clock already. That's pretty great. Um, okay, uh, OB, you have any last questions, or should I wrap it up for today? Or what? What? what are you doing? Hank, uh, are you, you have you run into any uh, performance issues that, uh, that you want to share? With the group. Hank, Hank is a friend of mine. He does DevOps. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, th I I was just going to listen in, but I think a lot of times the Rails uh, caching can be a panacea that may not, you know, may not be the right thing for the application. I was going to ask, you know, what are some actual um, outliers for using caching in Rails where maybe it is not a fit was going to be one of my questions. You know, a type of application or a use case where you think caching is not a good strategy, whether it be model caching or action caching, et cetera. That was going to be one of my questions. Yeah, and actually, I'd, Alex, I'd, Alexander, I'd, I'd love to get your views on, on caching Rails overall, you know, because uh, a lot of times it is the first thing you turn to uh, in order yeah. to optimize, uh, because even if, you know, even if you have a lot of sloppy active record code that, you know, very bloated or whatever, if you throw, if you throw fragment caching on top of it, it, it can make the problem go away. Uh, so, yeah, I tend to skip caching because it's uh, it's the first thing that you usually do and uh, the thing that everybody does. And really, you need to do caching, and I do that a lot. And the only limit to caching is the is the length of your uh, cache. Uh, how do I call it properly? Like. The expiration. Mm -hmm. it. No, it's uh, so. For example, if you have uh, ca too many cache keys, uh, then you'll probably have less efficient cache. Uh, and in some cases, I I ended up historically in in the, in the course of several years, I ended up with a code which had 20 cache keys. And the question is, of course, does this cache even ever gets triggered? No, uh, of course it's not. No. Too, too many too many cache keys. So unless you have too many cache keys, uh, that caching is, go is going to work. Um, so my definite, like my answer would be in short, use caching and see if if you have too many cache keys, you you, you need to start looking at uh, actual rendering optimization or uh, query optimization. Um, I do use memcache. Hey, can you can you elaborate on what you mean by too many cache keys? Do you mean do you mean that the actual performance of the cache degrades? Uh, no, it's just uh, if you're if for example you have uh, a user. You have uh, imagine a list of tasks for you tasks for a user. Uh, you have a list of tasks for a given user uh, with given status created uh, during given uh, period of dates, and if those are your uh, cache keys, those uh, then you have a problem that often you will miss the cache. 
because of some com combination of key values. And if you start missing cache a lot, then you will spend more time caching. That, that's kind of my so usual problem with the caching. So that's a case where it's good to ask for more data than is needed sometimes. Uh, sometimes yes, but sometimes you need to present the <laughs> sometimes you need to present the like restricted set of data and then you yeah you but, but like uh, if like um, if you had um, like a calendar sort of thing and they, they were only showing like the next seven days um, how would you uh, how, how might you um, set up a cache key for that situation like where you're showing the uh, the next the uh, next 14 days like I think basecamp did within its early version um, uh -huh. Because it would change every day, and you'd have to regenerate the. Uh, well, I guess it make it it'd probably makes sense at that point, but just an arbitrary example. Well, with calendar, what I would do is uh, I would have uh, like I would I would choose uh, an approach to cache all data started from today and back, and do not cache anything in the future uh, as a first step. Mm -hmm. I, I would do something like this, and then see if uh, if I need to do something something else. That that's probably the simple answer to this question. Um, speaking about caching, um, have you guys? Uh, so um, let me ask you: uh, How far did have you seen what I was showing uh, regarding uh, template rendering? So, where, when did you lose me? I didn't. I didn't quite. Um, I didn't quite understand the question. So, when I was showing the uh, render collection thing, um, when did you lose me? On what point? Oh, you mean earlier? Uh, um, yeah. No, I think you, I think you had finished. Uh, okay, so uh, let, let we me. We lost you when I, we, we lost you when I was talking. Uh -huh. Okay, so um, let me get back to that um, for a moment. It's sort of connected to caching issue. Um, so, for example, uh, like I was showing that Rails takes to effect two seconds just to render 10k empty templates, right? And how do you think where and what is going on? So what Rails is doing during those two seconds? Like any ideas? Any guesses? I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that there's just like a ridiculous amount of strings being created and destroyed. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, no, well, not really, uh, because remember, it's an empty template, so you do not have too many strings. And it turns out that what Rails is doing is it spends time looking up for templates in a cache, looking up for event subscribers in a cache, and that takes like 10% of that time, like 20, 200 milliseconds. Which probably explains why the, the performance has gotten worse with each subsequent release of Rails, major release of Rails, because it probably tracks the addition of heavy event listeners everywhere. Yeah. So in Rails 2, you, when you wanted to log something, you just called logger and then did some work, right? And you had uh, a condition that in production mode, you do not have to log anything. But with Rails 4 and Rails 3, if you want to log something, you just notify the logger all times, at all times, and then logger decides, okay, I got notified, and I got notified 10K times, and I will not do anything. So that actually takes 40% of those two seconds. That's a ridiculous amount of time just for login, in my opinion. So, 
I haven't done any additional research on this, but I will probably in some point uh, because logging in these conditions is uh, is probably what makes template rendering slow in most cases, even if uh, you do not have too many partials to render. All right. Uh, any other questions? None for me. If anyone else has any questions, uh, we'll tackle them. Otherwise, uh, maybe we'll wrap up. What do you say, Jeff? Sounds good. Well, uh, I just want to thank everyone for, or actually, uh, Alexander, if, if you have any uh, last words, if you want to just say the last thing or what you're working on, and uh, yeah, just uh, any last summary thoughts. All right. So, um, hey, I'm. I was I was fixing performance problem for for many years, but this year I started to actually uh, investigate them in detail, and I'm currently writing a book on Rails performance, or, or it's more correct to say on Ruby performance. Uh, I actually signed a contract with uh, Pragmatic Programmers, so if if you're interested in a Ruby performance book or Rails performance book. Just, uh, don't like right. <laughs> whoa, oh, whoa, whoa. Why? Wow, that's rough. That is rough. I work, I work for the competition. I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you two <laughs> thumbs up over there to counteract this guy over here. See that right there? You're going to get two. And they're way up. Oh, <laughs> Large, I'm a large screen those right there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so okay. if you guys are interested in uh, in reading more about this uh, in performance in general, uh, just um, feel free to visit. Uh, let me show you the robyperformancebook.com site and sign up for my mailing list so I can notify you when I'm done. And hopefully I will be done sometime sometime this year. And I, I think I write better English than, than I speak, or at least my, my editors think that I do. Uh, so I hope that that's going to be a useful source of performance information. I, I think you actually did fine. How about a round of applause for Alexander? Thank you. Okay. All right, so this has been a, a great talk with Alexander and based on Ruby on Rails performance Q&A. Um, so we want to give a big thank you for him for joining us for Airport 2014 and also for tomorrow. We start off in the morning at 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time with professional animations in Angular JS 1.3. Continue around 11 with if we don't if we're agile, why do we need managers? Question mark. And then uh, at 1 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time is graph databases and spreadsheets. And finishing out tomorrow at 6 p.m. Daylight Day is understanding Google's Panda algorithm. We're excited to do that and continue with AirConf 2014. And before we give it up one more time for Mr. Alexander G. Thank you. And thank you very much. And enjoy the night, everyone.